This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Githui Yort. It's Wednesday, February 12th. This is Africa 54. Sudanese citizens react following news that former President Omar al-Bashir will be turned over to the International Criminal Court. The White House proposes a deep cut in aid that America provides to foreign countries. And Africa 54 takes a closer look at where the Internet actually lives. The Sudanese government and Darfur rebels agreed that all those wanted by the International Criminal Court should appear in an ICC courtroom, including ousted President Omar al-Bashir, who is wanted on charges of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide in Darfur. David Doyle reports. Sudan's ousted President Omar al-Bashir is a step closer to appearing before the International Criminal Court on charges of war crimes, genocide and crimes against humanity in Darfur. That's after Sudan's government and Darfur rebel groups agreed on Tuesday that all those wanted by the ICC should appear before it. <laughs> Authorities did not specifically name the ex-president, but announced that the decision applies to all five suspects wanted by the ICC, of which Bashir is one and said that, quote, we cannot achieve justice unless we heal the wound using justice itself. But Bashir, who has been jailed in Khartoum since he was toppled by mass protests last year, refuses to deal with the court, his lawyer says. He believes the Hague-based ICC is a political court and its allegations against him part of a Western conspiracy. Those charges relate to the Darfur conflict between 2003 and 2008, when a mainly non-Arab rebellion in the impoverished western region was suppressed. Government forces and mostly Arab militia were accused of widespread atrocities. Bashir faces five counts of crimes against humanity for murder, forcible transfer, extermination, torture and rape, two counts of war crimes for attacks against civilians and three counts of genocide. Sudan's government also said it will set up a special Darfur court to try those not indicted by the ICC. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. Now, prosecutors reiterated that pro-Bashir forces tried to destroy entire ethnic groups in Sudan's Darfur region as they fought to suppress a rebellion that began in 2003. Protesters marched in Khartoum, both for and against Bashir's impending trial before the ICC. After being deposed in a military coup, Bashir was jailed in the country's notorious Koba prison, where many of his own victims had been locked up and tortured. For more insight into this story, I'm joined by Cameron Hudson, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Mr. Hudson, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much. Now, this is a major change for Sudan, especially now this transitional government cooperating with the ICC. What does the decision mean for international justice, for Africa and the world? Well, it's a landmark decision, and I think it catapults Sudan from the country that was really leading the international coalition against the court to serving up to the court its biggest and most important case to date in one fail swoop. So it really is a, a complete 180 on the part of, uh, of the Sudanese government um, and uh, I think a, a shot in the arm, as they say, for international justice. Now remember Africa, so for many, you know, whatever reasons, any time the ICC said, can you hand him over to us, they would all say no. Now, That's what right. does this mean now for Africa, especially? We know that there are people who have been accused of crimes against humanity that should be going to ICC, but uh, that was not the stand of the African Union either. Well, I think it's going to put pressure on the African Union to, to rethink some of its, uh, its past policies. Uh, certainly, the African Union has felt that the ICC had unfairly targeted African uh, 
leaders for their crimes over uh, crimes committed in Asia or Latin America. Um, I would note, though, that many of the cases that have been referred to the ICC were driven by Africans themselves. So Africans who were upset with their own domestic uh, justice systems calling in the ICC for, for assistance when those crimes were committed. So now, in practical terms, we're just about to witness history, to see al-Bashir in ICC courtroom answering questions on what happened in Darfur and all the other atrocities that his leadership committed against the Sudanese people. Well, practically, we're a few steps away from seeing him in The Hague. Um, I think we're all very hopeful that that day will, will come. Uh, certainly, the first step is making a commitment to cooperate with the indictments that have been handed down. Um, but what we heard yesterday from Juba, where the, the peace talks between the government and uh, the armed movements are taking place, is that uh, the condition for Bashir being turned over or cooperating with the court is that it is part of a larger peace deal that the government is trying to secure with the remaining armed movements in the country. So it's really dependent upon that kind of comprehensive peace, and this is a function of that. Now, the Sudan's transition, you know, from Bashir's leadership to what we are witnessing now, we know that it's been very fragile. We also saw that there, were re there was a bit of rebellion. We saw the shooting uh, happening in the uh, intelligence buildings and kind of leaves this transitional government, uh, you know, it looks a little bit, you know, fearful that they will be able to make such bold moves. Uh, what do you think this decision means politically for this transition government? I actually think that, that this decision demonstrates that there is a bit of uh, unity of purpose between the civilians and the military in the government. I don't believe that the civilian government would have taken this such a such a bold and risky move had it not consulted with the military beforehand, had it not had the military on its side. And so, um, you know, importantly, when we look at the statement that was made yesterday, it was made by the Supreme Council, not by the civilian cabinet. It was made by the Supreme Council, which is which is controlled right now by the military, and the military are leading the peace talks on behalf of the government inside of uh, inside of Juba right now. So my interpretation of all of this is that this this uh, announcement and decision was made with the blessing of the of uh, the military. Now, uh, Mr. Cameron, you worked on in Sudan for over 20 years. What does this? mean for you when you look back at all the atrocities you witnessed, including in Darfur, for you in person and for the people of Darfur? Well, I mean, it's, it's a new Sudan. Um, it, is a, it is a completely new Sudan. It's a Sudan that uh, takes justice and accountability and the rule of law seriously for the first time in more than a generation. Um, obviously, we want to see uh, justice delivered for the many, many victims of atrocity crimes in Darfur. More than two million people uh, continue to be displaced inside and outside the country. Uh, more than 300,000 people murdered during, uh, during that conflict in Darfur. We can't remember the many uh, hundreds of thousands murdered in the, in the long civil war between North and South uh, and, and across the country. So I think that uh, this is a testament to the new government's uh, interest in entering into the international community once again, being, uh, being brought into the fold, as it were. Uh, we've seen them not just improve their relationship with the ICC, but the government announced last week a new uh, UN peacekeeping mission that, that it wanted to invite in. So uh, trying to make amends with the ICC, the UN, the state of Israel, which it has reached out to recently, we're seeing a historic break from past policies of the Bashir regime, trying to make amends for the many, many crimes and transgressions committed over 30 years. Well, and uh, very briefly, 15 seconds, your reaction to the protests from the loyalists of Bashir after this, uh, you know, handing over to ICC statement came out. It's the last gasp of a, of a fading regime. Uh, that's all there is to say. Mr. Cameron, thank you very much for your insight. Thank you. All right. Um, Cameron Hudson is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Kenya's former longest ruling president, Daniel Arap Moy, was buried at his estate in the Rift Valley on Wednesday. Moy, who died last week at 95, gained praise for keeping Kenya mostly stable during his 24-year rule, but also criticism for a legacy of corruption that still haunts the East African nation. His coffin was flown early Wednesday morning to the estate by military helicopter about 185 kilometers northwest of Nairobi. There it was transferred by a gun carriage into a large tent 
for a religious service and speeches by politicians. Moy came to power in 1978 when he was serving as vice president after the nation's first president, Jomo Kenyatta, died. U.S. President Donald Trump is proposing a steep 21% cut in aid that America provides to foreign countries. And the State Department says it stands by the draft budget. But U.S. lawmakers who control the budget process say the proposed cuts in foreign assistance would weaken U.S. national security and global leadership. VOS in the same report from Washington. U.S. foreign aid to developing countries and to international relief organizations is the target of drastic cuts in the Trump administration's budget for the third year in a row. Each year, Congress rejected the cuts to foreign aid and approved more money than asked for, prompting this exchange at the State Department Monday. For the last three years, you got, uh, you know, these proposals have been made. Now, while this is 21% cut and not 34 or 35% as in previous years, it's been laughed off the hill. We absolutely stand by this budget. Um, we think it's, it prioritizes the most important needs identified by the great men and women of the State Department and USAID. This is a bottom-up process of how we come up with the priorities. Some members of Congress were quick to denounce the cuts, including House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Elliot Engel, who called the cuts reckless and said they would weaken U.S. leadership in the world if ever enacted. Some foreign policy experts say President Donald Trump should realize that foreign aid is an effective tool to address pressing problems. If we're not doing that, other places uh, are going to see more violence and uh, poor governance and the sorts of problems that he tries to address by building a wall um, on the southern border, migrants and refugees. These are the sorts of things that are uh, addressed by foreign aid. The State Department says the budget request maintains the United States as the single largest donor in humanitarian assistance and global health, while also asking other countries and partners to do more. Cindy Sane, VOA News, Washington. President Trump is denying intervention in his own government sentencing recommendation for a political confidant convicted of lying to Congress. Federal prosecutors initially recommended a prison sentence of seven to nine years for Roger Stone, a Trump associate who faced charges stemming from then special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. In a tweet earlier Tuesday, Trump had called that recommendation a miscarriage of justice. And later in the day, the Justice Department told the court in a filing that its initial recommendation could be considered excessive and unwarranted. No, I didn't speak to the justice. I'd be able to do it if I wanted. I have the absolute right to do it. Uh, I stay out of things. Uh, to a degree that people wouldn't believe, but I didn't speak to him. I thought the recommendation was ridiculous. I thought the whole prosecution was ridiculous. The president declined to comment whether, uh, when asked by reporters whether he was considering issuing a pardon for Stone. Stone is set to be sentenced in Washington next week. The watchdog group Restore Public Trust is calling for a congressional investigation and for the Justice Department's Inspector General to find out if political interference played a role in changing the sentencing recommendation. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come. A visit to the unlikely home of most of the world's internet exchanges. We'll be back. about women's issues, it's about listening to them. 
and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. Kyoko Mutiki estimates he has transformed thousands of tons of discarded metal from supermarket trolley wheels to shredded metal from factories into art. The sculptor has worked with recycled metal for 30 years. Mutiki's childhood memories and concerns about growing conflict between animals and humans in his country inspired him to sculpt wildlife. He grew up south of Nairobi, in the Rift Valley, where wildebeest once roamed vast plains. Those migration routes have largely disappeared due to human encroachment. Mwitiki has trained younger artists, including two men from Malawi, who returned home to start similar recycling programs. Next up, a robot is a newly introduced waitress at a fast food restaurant in Kabul, the first time in the war-torn country of Afghanistan. The Japan-made robot has become a local celebrity since her debut one month ago. The robot attracts Kabul residents to come to the restaurant in a country where many people suffer from daily conflicts and war. Tamiya brings the food from the restaurant kitchen to customers, and a particular electronic track is set to Taimiya to enable her to move to each table freely. And finally, Daniel Silverstein, whose fashion company is Zero Waste Daniel, creates clothing from bits and bolts of leftover cloth, with an eye to using, reusing, and recycling all that he can. Nearly three-fifths of all clothing is burned in incinerators or dumped in landfills, according to the New Standard Institute, a fashion industry sustainability group. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency estimates that in 2017, about 17 million tons of textiles were created and more than 11 million tons were deposited in landfills. About 2.6 million tons were recycled. Sustainable fashion can mean upcycling fabric into new fashions, minimizing water usage, dyes, and pesticides, or making goods to last and not quickly discarded for the next fast fashion trend, experts say. And that's what's trending today. In U.S. election news, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders claimed victory in the New Hampshire primary Tuesday, lifting him to front-runner status for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. In second place was former South Bend Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, followed by Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, who surprised many with a strong third-place showing. Here's VOA's Jim Malone. Bernie Sanders rode strong support from progressive Democrats and younger voters to a top finish in New Hampshire. Our campaign is not just about beating Trump. It is about transforming this country. It is about having the courage to take on Wall Street the insurance companies, the drug companies, the fossil fuel industry, the military industrial complex. Former Mayor Pete Buttigieg was a close second place in New Hampshire after finishing first in delegates in Iowa last week. Buttigieg vowed to bring Democrats together. 
We have been told by some that you must either be for a revolution or you are for the status quo. But where does that leave the rest of us? Most Americans don't see where they fit in that polarized vision. And we can't defeat the most divisive president in modern American history by tearing down anybody who doesn't agree with us 100% of the time. Perhaps the surprise of the night was the strong third place finish of Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar. Klobuchar recharged her campaign with a late surge of support from moderate voters and a strong showing in last Friday's debate. Donald Trump's worst nightmare is that the people in the middle, the people who have had enough of the name calling and the mud slinging, have someone to vote for in November. Klobuchar's top three finish came at the expense of Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren and former Vice President Joe Biden. Biden's fifth place showing was a blow to his presidential hopes, though he vowed to fight on when he spoke to supporters in South Carolina. So when you hear all these pundits and experts, uh, cable TV talkers talked about the race, uh, tell them, it ain't over, man. We're just getting started. Warren also and vowed to continue. Wrong. Our campaign is best positioned to beat Donald Trump in November because we can unite our party. Many New Hampshire voters said they were looking for the strongest candidate to take on President Trump in November. Tina Olson supported Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I went with my heart, you know. I believe in Medicare for all. You know, I think mo more than anything, you know, we're the only developed country who doesn't have it. Lizanne Platt voted for Amy Klobuchar. But to be honest, whoever gets the nomination, I mean, whoever gets the nomination, I will be voting for them. Businessman Andrew Yang and Colorado Senator Michael Bennett both suspended their campaigns after poor showings in New Hampshire. The still crowded Democratic race now moves on to Nevada and South Carolina for contests later this month. Jim Malone, VOA News, Washington. Now, for more on Tuesday's New Hampshire primary, BOA's Caroline Prasuti is standing by live in Manchester, New Hampshire. Hello, Caroline. How surprising was it that Bernie Sanders... Hello, Esther. How, how surprising was it that Bernie Sanders took the New Hampshire uh, vote? Well, it was expected that he would lead the race, especially since he won this primary four years ago. But consider this. He won by two points over Pete Buttigieg. So it's that narrow margin of victory that surprised everyone. Four years ago, when I said that he won, won that primary, he won it by 22 points. So you can see the difference in this year. Of course, uh, Amy Klobuchar was another surprise, that sudden surge that she had from the, her, uh, the bump that she got in the Iowa caucus, and then her performance in the debate held here on Friday. So, Caroline, where does the race go now that New Hampshire's uh, primary is over? The next is Nevada. It's a caucus in Nevada, a western state. And then after that, we have a primary in South Carolina on February 29th. And then on March 3rd, 14 states vote, either in primaries or caucuses. And we call that Super Tuesday. You can expect that field of candidates to be narrowed down immensely after that. So, uh, Caroline, where does the Democratic Party now go with these results? What happens next? That's a really good question, Esther, and I, I'm sure a lot of the officials there are contemplating that right now. Who they have at the top of the ticket is a, pro a progressive, Bernie Sanders, right? But then right below Bernie is a moderate, followed by another moderate. So does the Democratic Party want to completely change the government, or do they want to go with a status quo, which is how the Democrats ruled under, uh, under President Barack Obama? Wish we had more and time, And it seems Caroline. like, you know, uh -huh. the voters are undecided, too. Yeah. You know, it's, it seems they're undecided, too, all the voters are, because they are... Are, are split. You know, half of them going for Bernie, half of them going for Pete. Thank you so much, Caroline, for your excellent coverage. VOA's Caroline Prasuti reporting My live pleasure. for us from Manchester, New Hampshire.
Have you ever stored something on the cloud and wondered where that data goes? You might be surprised to learn it is in a quiet residential community located about 30 miles outside of Washington, D.C. The majority of the world's internet traffic passes through the town of Ashburn in London County, Virginia, home to one of the world's largest internet exchanges. Viewers Dora McCoy reports. While thousands of families moved in to live and play in this bedroom community, the town of Ashburn in Loudoun County, Virginia, quietly became home to the most dense fiber network anywhere in the world. It's amazing when you think about the amount of fiber that's in the ground. Uh, we, we have both sides of the road pretty much have fiber troughs in them and now we're putting some fiber in the middle of the roads as well. 70% of the world's internet traffic passes through all of that fiber. That's why Ashburn is known as Data Center Alley, the Silicon Valley of the East. Pretty much any email sent or received anywhere around the globe comes this way. If you've got something stored on the cloud, it's probably in one of these data centers. The cloud is based somewhere, and by and large, the cloud has been based here in Loudoun County, Virginia, in the data centers, the 18 million square feet of data centers that we have on the ground here. AOL, America Online, was among the first to move to Ashburn in the 1990s. AOL brought fiber and power infrastructure with it. May East, one of the world's first internet exchanges, moved to Loudoun in the late 90s after first forming in 1992. I mean, it was a couple guys who got together over some beers and decided that they were gonna, that they were gonna allow one another to pass traffic back and forth across the different networks that they'd been creating. Other companies followed each new addition contributing to the growing digital infrastructure. Tech titans like Amazon and Google have a presence here. Northern Virginia's appeal includes reasonably priced land, low cost but dependable electricity, access to water to cool the equipment, and a skilled, educated population. The internet itself is really um, comprised of these peering points that are housed inside data centers. So without data centers, you wouldn't really have the internet. Data centers provide power, cooling, and connectivity, ensuring that computer applications used by their clients are up and running around the clock. They want to ensure that all of their customers, wherever they are, uh, can, can get to it through the Internet. Security is tight. With nondescript exteriors, data centers aren't flashy, but they are very profitable. Loudon expects to take in $320 million in local tax revenue from data centers this year alone. Data centers, for every dollar we spend on them, we get about $15 back, which is a great return on our investment. Dora McQuar, VOA News, Ashburn, Virginia. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.